Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. So when Tulsi Gabbard won the Democratic Party's primary for a congressional seat in Hawaii 10 years ago, she'd effectively won the seat. Hawaii may be the most liberal out of all 50 states. It is a Democratic state, flat out. It has not voted for a Republican presidential candidate in nearly 40 years. So if you get elected as a Democrat in Hawaii, it's not exactly breaking news. It's standard operating procedure. And yet when Tulsi Gabbard won that primary and then the seat, the Democratic National Party took a deep interest in her, and you can see why. Here was a smart, appealing 31-year-old who knew what she believed and could explain it fluently. And by the way, she was also an Iraq War veteran. So in political terms, Tulsi Gabbard was near perfect, and they got it immediately. Barack Obama endorsed her right away. Nancy Pelosi called her personally and invited Tulsi Gabbard, did you remember this, to speak on the opening night of the Democratic National Convention. And then once she was sworn into Congress in January, the DNC named Tulsi Gabbard vice chair of the National Party. she just gotten there, and she was vice chair of the DNC. And then, of course, the media played its prescribed role. If Nancy Pelosi likes you, well, so do they. So fawning profile after fawning profile emerged. If you lived in Washington at the time, you remember it very well. Here, ladies and gentlemen, the future of the Democratic Party, Tulsi Gabbard. In case you don't remember, here's a selection to jog your memory. Watch out for the next superstar. Here we it's, go. Here we go. Talking about off air all week. Hey, listen, here hey, we listen. go. Tulsi Gabbard. Tulsi Gabbard is a rising star in this party. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard should be here tonight. Uh, the reality is we do not have enough young veterans in this party, enough young women in this party, enough people of color in this party. You're considered a rising star in the Democratic Party. You had a position of leadership in the Democratic National Committee. Tulsi's story is really, I think, tailor-made for Hollywood. I half expect Natalie Portman to be vying for the role any day now <laughs> because this story is not to be believed. Tulsi Gabbard, she is going to be the one to watch tonight at the DNC. And Tulsi Gabbard, she's an Iraq War veteran. Yeah. Yesterday she was promoted yeah. from captain to major in the Hawaii National yeah, Guard. So she certainly is a rising star. The yeah. The fact that she's not here yeah, tonight for whatever bad. reason is unfair. I don't know, but in a battle, I want her in my trench. I can hear that <laughs> <laughs> me too, me too. Did you hear that? She's a rising star. Hollywood's going to make a movie about her. I want her in my trench. It's pretty hard to believe now, but that was the absolute consensus among Democratic Party sycophants until 2016. In 2016, as if by command from above, the fawning stopped abruptly, replaced initially by silence, and then by howls of scorned rage. So what happened in 2016? Well, Donald Trump was elected president. And then a few days later, displaying the independence of spirit that Democrats claim to love in young women, but actually despise more than anything, Tulsi Gabbard decided to talk to the new president about an issue that she cared about, which was U.S. policy towards Syria, a country that, again, Gabbard was virtually alone in pointing out has an awful lot of Christians in it, so maybe we should pay attention. As she put it at the time, quote, I felt it was important to take the opportunity to meet with the president-elect now before the drumbeats of war that neocons have been beating drag us into an escalation of the war to overthrow the Syrian government. Woo, we can't say that in Washington. Maybe she didn't know. But they told her, stop. Let the adults do it. But Gabbard didn't seem to care. A few weeks later, she went personally to Syria. She was a member of Congress. You can do that. And she wanted to see conditions for herself. And then while she was there, she met with the Syrian president, Bashar al-Assad. And that was it. It was over. Whether Tulsi Gabbard knew it or not, her career as a rising star within the Democratic Party came to a complete, abrupt, and final halt. She had done the one thing you're not allowed to do. She committed the one unforgivable sin, which is to question permanent Washington's foreign policy. You can't do that, and everyone knows it. And if you look around, you can see that no one does do it. They always tell you how radical Sandy Cortez is, Rashida Tlaib. Would they do that? No way. AOC may be a socialist, but in the end, she's with Bill Kristol and Liz Cheney on Team Raytheon. She does not cross that line because you're not allowed to. But Tulsi Gabbard is someone who had served in the U.S. military, in fact, was still serving in the U.S. military, was an elected member of Congress, decided, why shouldn't I say? what I think, and so she did. And for doing that, overnight, her fellow Democrats accused Tulsi Gabbard, the combat veteran you'd want in your foxhole, of committing treason against the country she was serving. Hillary Clinton went even farther than that. Speaking of conspiracy nuts, Hillary Clinton way crazier than Alex Jones ever thought of being. She claimed the Russians were grooming Tulsi Gabbard as some kind of Manchurian candidate. You wanna to listen to lunacy? Listen to this. I'm not making any predictions, 
But I think they've got their eye on somebody who's currently in the Democratic <laughs> primary and are grooming her to be the third party candidate. Mm -hmm. She's a favorite of the Russians. Well, that's just completely whacked. Was she a crisis actor, too? What a lunatic. But no one noticed because everyone was saying it. The L.A. Times, which at one point was an actual newspaper, accused Tulsi Gabbard of, quote, talking like a Russian asset, maybe a spy. So the years went by and Tulsi Gabbard decided to run for president, still as a Democrat, as she had been in her entire time in Congress. She'd always been a Democrat, of course, the vice chair of the DNC. And so she wound up in a presidential debate in October of 2019, and she responded to the smears against her. Watch this. New York Times and CNN have also smeared veterans like myself for calling for an end to this regime change war. Uh, just two days ago, the New York Times put out a, an article saying that I'm a, a Russian asset and an Assad apologist and all these different smears. This morning, a CNN commentator said on national television that I'm an asset of Russia. Completely despicable. As president, I will end these regime change wars by doing two things, ending the draconian sanctions that are really a modern day siege, the likes of which we are seeing Saudi Arabia wage against Yemen that have caused tens and thousands of Syrian civilians to die and to starve. And I would make sure that we stop supporting terrorists like Al Qaeda in Syria, who've been the ground force in this ongoing regime change Thank you. war. They called her a Russian asset. Now, that slur is so common that we don't really think about it, but think about it just for a second. This is a transparently patriotic person, an elected member of Congress who is serving in the U.S. Army, who's also, by the way, one of the nicest people in all of Washington, who is making traditionally liberal points about war. Not that all wars are bad or war is never necessary. She's participated in wars personally. She's merely saying, and has said, dozens of times on television, that wars that don't benefit the United States are probably a bad idea for us to engage in. That's all she said. And for that, she was run out of town. Now, why is that? Why is that such an unacceptable thing to say? Well, of course, because there's a pattern here. Certain people do benefit from wars and they want more. So three years after that debate, another U.S.-funded regime change war is underway. And that is exactly what's happening. This time, our stated goal is removing not some third world dictator who might have WMD, but removing a guy who is the world's largest nuclear stockpile. 6,300 nuclear warheads. Vladimir Putin. And once again, because Tulsi Gabbard has questioned the wisdom of this complete lunacy, Democrats are accusing her of working for Vladimir Putin. So if you want to know what the Democratic Party actually believes, don't listen to what they say. Oh, we want empowered women of color who are also veterans. No, they don't. They want people who support regime change war. That's their red line. That's the one thing they will brook no dissent on whatsoever. They don't care what you think about that. They don't want to debate you on it. If you disagree or even ask questions, they go right to traitor. So today, Tulsi Gabbard did what is probably inevitable and probably has been since 2016. She left her own party, the Democratic Party. And we don't have to guess as to why, because she explained it in some detail. And we ask you, please listen carefully to this because it's inspiring and interesting. And she did it on her new podcast called The Tulsi Gabbard Show. It launched today. Here she is. I can no longer remain in today's Democratic Party. It's now under the complete control of an elitist cabal of warmongers driven by cowardly wokeness who divide us by racializing every issue and stoking anti-white racism, who actively work to undermine our God-given freedoms enshrined in our Constitution, and who are hostile to people of faith and spirituality, who demonize the police, who protect criminals at the expense of law-abiding Americans, who believe in open borders, who weaponize the national security state to go after their political opponents, and above all, are dragging us ever closer to nuclear war. Now, these are some of the main reasons I'm leaving the Democratic Party. So keep in mind, until today, this was a registered Democrat, an office holder, a standard bearer of the Democratic Party, the future of the Democratic Party from the country's most liberal state. This was a liberal Democrat. Did you hear that? Is there a single word you disagree with? 
Is there a single word that the Republican who represents you, who you send money to, who you vote for, would repeat in public? In other words, here you have someone who until yesterday was a member of the Democratic Party saying things the overwhelming majority of Republican voters believe, but only a tiny, a vanishingly small minority of Republican office holders are willing to say out loud because it's too scary. Oh, it just tells you so much. Subscribe to the Fox News YouTube channel to catch our nightly opens, stories that are changing the world and changing your life. I'm Tucker Carlson tonight.